This is Dr. Mobin Sayed with one more episode of Long Story Short with Dr. Bean from the FLCCC platform. So last weekend, we had the FLCCC conference, beautiful conference. I was starstruck. There were so many experts and great doctors over there. I think the time was a little limited. So my presentation, 30 minutes presentation, 15 minutes question and answers. I think I didn't have sufficient time to explain the topic that I was covering. So what I did was I decided to present the same topic separately in divided topics so that we can upload them as complete episodes as well. Let's start. I think you'll have fun with this one. If you were present during the conference, great. Thank you very much for being there. And here is the presentation once more. And we are going to divide it into three parts. First part is the spicopathy or spicopathogenesis, that how does the pathologies associated with spike occur. The second part will be intermittent fasting. We have already discussed that as well, but we'll discuss in this context. And the third one is spermidin and resveratrol. So let's start with our first part of the discussion. So eventually the point of this discussion is the management approach. And if you wanted to say, tell me the management approach right away, then an easier way is to go to flccc.net. Over there, there are protocols and just look at the protocols for vaccine injury and the protocols for long COVID and these should help. So let's start. So this is the spike that we're going to talk about. I have one more spike drawing that I think you'll enjoy. So this is another drawing of the spike protein. It is standing on top of an endothelial cell, which the cell itself has become damaged. And if you see here, this little grains here are depicting reduction in nitric oxide release. And these little pieces here, these little structures here, these are presenting an increased cell adhesion molecules that are expressed on a spike damaged endothelial cell and would cause inflammation. So going back here to our presentation. So first we're going to talk about spicopathy and spicopathogenesis. So spicopathy will be, and I believe Dr. Paul Merrick coined these terms. So I'm kind of borrowing it from him. I think if I remember correctly, it was him who first said these. So spicopathy is the pathology caused by spike protein. And spicopathogenesis is the mechanism by which that pathology occurs. And by no means, I think we can cover all the mechanisms of pathogenesis by spike because we are still discovering there's a lot that is coming to surface every day. So you could consider this to be as much as we know so far and maybe even that not fully captured here. So first, the persistence of the spike proteins. So we have many studies about this. There are studies that show that the S1 part of the spike protein. So if you go back here to the spike protein, spike protein, let's say this blue part is the S2 part. And then the remaining red part is S1. And within the S1 is the receptor binding domain or RBD. And RBD further has a receptor binding motif. And that part is where the spike actually binds with S2 enzyme. So here we, we know that there are studies that show that within the monocytes, the S1 part of the spike proteins are present and these would cause monocyte to become dysregulated and continue to produce inflammatory molecules that would cause inflammation. Now, sadly, actually it is a good thing, but sadly in this case, these monocytes are usually patrolling the boundaries of our vascular or tissue boundaries and vessel barriers are also boundaries of the tissue so blood brain barrier blood thymus barrier blood testis barrier and other such barriers have a possibility of monocytes lurking there patrolling there and also being dysregulated when they cause inflammation then those barriers will be inflamed then there are studies as well that show the viral persistence so there are two types of viral persistences or two types of hosts for persistence. One are immunocompromised or immunosuppressed. 
For example, there was a study from South Africa that showed a woman that was immunocompromised because of HIV and the drugs were not working as well. She had SARS-CoV-2 for 256 days in her. So immunocompromised or immunosuppressed patients can have SARS-CoV-2 in them for a longer period of time. On the other hand, immunocompetent hosts, healthy individuals, can also have the SARS-CoV-2 and the studies that have shown in the competent individuals for the SARS-CoV-2 to be present is even up to 90 days. I'm sure it can be beyond that as well, but up to 90 days have been demonstrated by studies. So if the virus is present, then the spike protein from the virus will become circulating and available as well. Then the persistence of the spike protein because of the persistence of the messenger RNA from the vaccine. So the messenger RNA's fate in our cells has to be from two days to two weeks. Although the studies are showing that in the local regional lymph nodes, so that means if the injection is given in the, let's say, deltoid muscle here, then the local regional lymph nodes, I'm pointing at my axillary area and the neck side, the messenger RNA has been seen to be present in these immune cells for a longer period of time, even up to two months. And that means the spike production in those cells could be going on for a couple of months or maybe even more. But this is two months that is shown in the studies. So if you see here in this diagram, this is important diagram, this big blob is the cell that has, let's say, messenger RNA in it. Or this could also be an infected cell. And the cell is making spike proteins. If it is infected, then it is making other parts of the virus as well. Then what happens is these spike proteins can exit the cell once again in many ways. One way is that the spike protein is shredded, it is broken down in the endosomes, and then it is presented, parts of it are presented on the cell surface, that is called antigen presentation. That is not the spike protein, but the pieces of spike protein to activate the acquired arm. Spike protein can actually exit if the cell breaks down. So imagine if the acquired arm becomes active and the cytotoxic T cells or natural killer cells of the innate arm, they come and destroy the cell. Now the spike proteins present in it are going to spill out. Then the spike proteins can also exit a cell. When the spike protein inside the cell becomes packaged in a vesicle and that vesicle exit the cell. So that will be the extracellular vesicles. We have done these discussions in other chats as well. So there are some references present here as well. So eventually what this means is that spike protein present in our body, either because of the infection or because of the vaccine, the spike protein can be produced for a longer period of time. Now, what happens with the immune response? So imagine now that there is spike protein. Spike protein is going to be present during the acute infection. And as you saw, it can be present because of the vaccine as well. It can then persist as well. Now, the question is, when the spike protein is persisting and is available, then what kind of damage that can occur? So if you see here, the immune response abnormality because of the spike protein now remember, immune system responds to all kind of antigens. Spike protein is one such type. And so here, the spike protein seems to be a really tough one, really hard one, causing a lot of damage. So chronically activated monocytes, as was a study which showed that the spike protein is present in the monocytes. So these monocytes become activated and they have, the researchers have shown the monocytes to be active even up to 15 months afterwards after acquiring the spike protein. So chronically activated monocytes will cause activation of the inflammatory cells as well and cause inflammation. Then I remember when the COVID pandemic had started somewhere in March, April timeframe with the Math Plus protocol. This is 2020, I do not know the exact month. Dr. Paul Merrick had suggested that macrophage activation syndrome is a problem. And he had then presented Math Plus protocol to handle that situation. So macrophage activation syndrome, where the macrophages become disagulated, they are offended by the spike protein or they are actually digested it and this is an antigen and they are activating the immune system. Then anti-idiotype antibodies. So what happens is that when the spike proteins enter our body, remember they can bind with the ACE2, so keep that in mind. Now we make antibodies against the spike protein. 
so if I can go back to my picture for a second. So imagine this is the spike protein in my hand. And then we make antibodies that can bind to various parts of this and they can try to neutralize it or bind and take it away and make it delicious <laughs> for the macrophages. This is called opsonization. Opsonization is a process when we coat an antigen with, for example, complement system or antibodies and then macrophages and dendritic cells can find it easy to pick up these antigens using those little proteins as handles. So the antibody is produced. So we can call this antibody as anti-spike 2 or spike antibodies. Then our body has another mechanism which is called the network theory. This was coined by Neil Jenkins in 1960s. And the mechanism was, he said, that of course the body is going to try to eliminate these antibodies. And the body's mechanism to do that is to actually produce antibodies against this antibody. So if this is anti-spike antibody, then we can produce another antibody which is anti-spike antibody. Or it is also called, more simply, anti-idiotypical antibody. This antibody that can bind with the anti-spike antibody, guess what? This antibody has epitopes or has binding regions that look like spikes binding regions. Because it is a mirror of the mirror. So the result is that this autoantibody can bind with ACE2. It's not a complete spike protein. It is some epitopes of the spike protein's binding region, but they can still bind with the ACE2. And if they bind with the ACE2, they can do the ACE2 dysregulation as spike can do. So this is a very important point to keep in mind. And there is Dr. William Murphy who had done a study of finding anti-ACE2 antibodies or anti-idiotype antibodies in severe and less severe patients. And he found that less severe patients had these antibodies which were cleared out soon. But severe patients had these antibodies that did not clear out soon. So imagine a mirror of the spike protein is being produced by a cell in the form of antibody and it, it is continuously produced. That is a problem. So this is the immune response going incorrect now, right? Going bad now. So then spikopathy, the pathology. If you look at this diagram from the left towards the right, first let's start with the bottom, the floor. If you see the floor, imagine this is some tissue. Maybe this is lungs tissue or maybe this is endothelium, although endothelial cells look more flat, but some tissue. And what you see is that in this tissue, there are some cells that are in trouble, that there are some cells that have died, the black ones, the, their skulls are showing. And then there are some cells that are just worried. So what is happening is, on the surface of these cells, there is immune system response going on, and inflammation occurring, which is killing these cells or damaging these cells. So what is the response? So if you start from the left side towards the right, so again, you'll see on the left side that little cell that may be making spike proteins after it has the messenger RNA in it or it is infected. And those spike proteins will come out. Then these spike proteins, wherever they'll go, inflammation will start there. Then right next to it is an antibody that has become bound to a virus and virus is spike protein or is simply circulating spike protein, regardless of the virus. It could be coming from a vaccine or a virus. So here is that spike protein. And what happens is that this spike protein and the virus, this is called antigen-antibody complex. And that complex has deposited here. You can see that as well on the extreme right as well, that there are two spike proteins and then that antibody with the spike proteins has become deposited on the tissue. This is really bad. This is called type 3 hypersensitivity reaction. And what happens is that when these complexes are deposited somewhere on the tissue, the tissue says, you know what, I am in trouble. Because immune system cells are going to come over, the complement activation is going to occur, macrophages would become active over here, and the war will start, the mediators, inflammatory mediators will be released, that would cause local damage, they would bring in more cells, and this tissue is just in trouble. So imagine if this is endothelium, then the endothelium is in trouble. So then, if you see here, next to the antigen-antibody complex are the monocytes that are dysregulated. We have discussed them. Then is the macrophages that are dysregulated. Then the spike itself stuck to the cells. For example, on the endothelium. 
So think about it with me for a second. Endothelium is the inner surface of the blood vessels. And within the blood vessel, in the lumen of the blood vessel, is the blood which is passing. And the blood is water and proteins and electrolytes and blood cells. Imagine it's a river with fish in it. And the river bed has to be really slippery to allow these things to move swiftly without getting tangled on the river bed. So imagine the endothelium is that river bed. So endothelium tries its best to not obstruct the flow of the blood. And one such mechanism is to develop glycocalyx on the surface. Glycocalyx is glucose and protein meshwork. You may have seen in the swampy areas that the surface is covered by slimy fungi and plants to make it slippery. Imagine glycocalyx is a microscopic slime that is coated on top of endothelial cells. The spike proteins can actually tangle, they can get entangled in the glycocalyx, resulting in local inflammation on the glycocalyx and damage to the glycocalyx. So we're not talking about spike binding to the AS2, we're not talking about the spike getting into the cell, we're talking about spike getting stuck on the glycocalyx of the endothelium, damaging that, and that would cause its own issues by causing inflammation. Actually, glycocalyx damage can detach the endothelial cell, and that endothelial cell can detach and start circulating in the blood. And it is seen in studies, you would have the links in these studies with this talk, it is seen in the studies that non-dead endothelial cells are found circulating in the patients that are sick with COVID or that have spike pathologies. So I hope that from the left to the right, you can see various kinds of mechanisms that would occur when the pathology would occur. And then here is something that is really important. And that is, imagine this is a cell and this cell, specifically when it is endothelial cell, then we have even a bigger problem. But let's actually understand, this blue big cell has ACE2 receptors on it. So these orange looking things are ACE2 receptors. On one end is the spike protein attached to it. On the other end, the autoantibody or anti-idiotypical antibody is attached to it. They both are going to behave similarly with the spike protein, with the ACE2, and cause dysregulation of the cell. I would actually go in a little more discussion of what that dysregulation is. But just keep this in mind and hold this thought because we're going to talk about what happens inside the cell and what kind of dysregulation is that. That would also become very important for endothelium as well, the blood surface cells, blood vessel wall cells. Then if you see here on the left side, there is an antibody that is inverted and is complexed with the tissue. This is the result of tissue mimicry. So what happens is that imagine we have spike protein and we made antibodies against the spike protein. In various people, the antibodies will be formed against various parts of the spike protein. Now, it is possible, just like, you know, people have twins. The twins, they look like each other. Similarly, it is possible that to our body, the part of the spike protein that looks offending and we make antibodies against that, a similar part or pattern may be observed on our tissues as well. And so if we make antibodies against such part, then those antibodies might attack our own tissue as well. This is called molecular mimicry and the result is the autoimmune disease where the antibodies produced against an antigen incorrectly attack similar looking patterns on our tissue. So here, this antibody was supposed to bind with a spike protein, but it found that some parts of our tissue look like spike protein or has pattern of spike protein and it has attacked here. Now what happens is when this happens, this is called type 2 hypersensitivity reaction, where an antibody has become attached to a fixed tissue. This could be a surface of blood vessel, this could be glomerular filtration surfaces in the kidney, this could be liver, sinusoidal, endothelial cells, this could be barrier structures, this could be joint surfaces. So it can be many surfaces where this can happen. And when an antibody becomes connected to a tissue surface, 
then the complement activation is a process that starts then the macrophage activation would occur as well and local inflammation and tissue damage can occur so this is the concept of anti idiotypical antibodies we've already discussed them the only additional part I'm, i'll say here is if you look at this big diagram with this spaceship looking structure so here there are two antibodies that are bound to an antigen it could be one spike protein it could be multiple spike proteins it could be a sars cov 2 it can be other infections too this mechanism is a general mechanism in our body and then what happens is this little structure down here is called the complement so this is c c1q complement 1 c1 part of the complement proteins complement are proteins that are produced by the liver in response to inflammation and here antibodies can actually activate complement So wherever the antibody are complement activation will occur there which in turn complement is a really dangerous system once it becomes active it does two things it does many things but two important things for us to keep in mind number 1 complement system will end up producing little pipe like structures that will be anchored on the microbes let's say the viruses or bacteria or fungi but also on the local tissue so when you poke holes in the local tissues by way of inserting pipes in them then the cellular material would get out of the cell through those new pipes and the cell will become damaged and die so complement activation is not a light thing wherever it happens local tissue gets damaged the second thing is that once the complement is activated the macrophages find it easy to pick up tissues or microbes on which the complements are attached and eat them up and destroy them easily so complement activation means inflammation and destruction so that can happen and then as i said there are hypersensitivity reactions and that is when the spike binds to the tissue that is type 1 when the spike and the antibody complexes bind to some third party tissue that is called type 3 hypersensitivity reaction then the antibodies against spike can go and prime the mast cells and when the spikes are present and the mast cells have the antibodies on them then mast cell activation can occur as well so i'm going to stop here for the management approach and we'll continue this discussion next time i want to now still take you to another journey of spikopathy but more towards the endothelium so please bear with me a few more minutes so this will be a summary of the spikopathy but in overall bigger terms so we have now seen the mechanisms a little more in detail now let's see what kind of damage spike can do to the blood vessels so this is the paper that i'm going to discuss and some more papers which you would find in the links so here when the spike protein binds with an endothelial cell although this cell doesn't look like an endothelial cell endothelial cells are more flat and fried egg looking sunny side up towards the lumen surface or the inside of the blood vessel but imagine this is an endothelial cell and the spike is bound here to the as2 what are the things that would happen first of all spike causes nitric oxide production reduction and i did this discussion complete separately as well within the flccc talks i think last week or the week before so what happens is when the spike binds with the as2 and let me back up for a second i'm doing this for the completion sake so if there is a healthcare provider professional medical student or a non medical person they can see all the pathologies in one place then you can do your own research further from here so when the endothelium becomes attached to spike protein within the endothelial cell there is an enzyme called endothelial nitric oxide synthase enos that enos enzyme production becomes reduced This is also called uncoupling of enos. When the production of enos is reduced, then nitric oxide production is reduced. Inside the endothelium, the nitric oxide production is really important number 1 for keeping the vasodilatation or keeping blood vessels dilated and relaxed and number 2 for antioxidant behavior, number 3 for leukocyte adhesion prevention. or on the surface of the endothelium we do not want the white blood cells or inflammatory cells to attach there so nitric oxide helps with that 
and also nitric oxide that dissolves in the blood from the endothelial cell also prevents the platelets to aggregate with each other. I did that discussion before. So here just realize that there is a dysfunction of the endothelium which would cause vasoconstriction or less vasodilatation which in turn will mean less blood flow to the tissues and that would cause tissue damage, that would also cause hypoxia, that would also cause acidosis of the tissue because when the blood flow to the tissue is less, then the nutritional supply is less, oxygen supply is less and garbage removal and carbon dioxide removal is less as well which would cause acidotic environment and even tissue damage. Blood pressure alterations would occur. So when the blood vessels cannot constrict properly, normally larger blood vessels stay in a dilated state and we can then as we maintain our blood pressure to various organs we constrict them as needed but imagine we are not producing enough nitric oxide to relax them so they're always constricted so that would cause blood pressure change and secondly blood pressure maintenance will become a problem because we want these to sometimes relax as well actually mostly we want them to be relaxed then thrombosis will occur thrombosis would occur because the blood flow is sluggish especially when it becomes sluggish in the veins then the blood start clotting there there is a propensity of blood to start clotting in the veins especially in the veins of the legs and especially in women then as the nitric oxide is reduced interestingly superoxide dismutase enzyme becomes reduced as well so that is a coupling when the enos works then the superoxide dismutase which is an other enzyme that reduces it dismutates it partitions superoxides which are reactive oxygen species but when the enos is reduced because of the spike protein then this sod or superoxide dismutase is reduced as well which allows the reactive oxygen species to freely move around and freely be produced without anyone partitioning and destroying them so that would mean that the endothelial cells would start getting damage reactive oxygen species damage then we saw last time as well platelet aggregation would start occurring because the nitric oxide is helpful in reducing the aggregation. Similarly, nuclear factor kappa B is a system within the cells and this system, nuclear factor kappa B, is under the influence of enos, endothelial nitric oxide synthase, to work less. And if this is not working less, meaning if it becomes more active because there is less enos, then there are more cell adhesion molecules that are produced which would go to the surface of endothelium and capture various white blood cells. So that would cause local inflammation as well. We have also seen that the ACE2 occupation by this spike protein will cause ACE1 and ACE2 imbalance. And that imbalance would, ACE1 is pro-inflammatory and vasoconstrictive and ACE2 is anti-inflammatory and vasodilatory. So when you take away the anti-inflammatory behavior and the vasodilatation behavior, then you are left with pro-inflammatory and vasoconstrictive behavior, which both are damaging. ACE2 is a very potent vasoconstrictor. That would mean hypertension, blood pressure, and blood flow issues, and vasoactivity issue. But there is one more thing. As the spike protein binds with the ACE2, this is a very delicate point, so give me your attention for a few seconds. And this point I have never discussed before, so this is a new gem here. So as the spike protein binds with the ACE2, this complex is internalized or we call it phagocytosed. It is brought into the cell. So sometimes you may have watched videos where a house or bunch of trees, they just sink in the ground because there is a pothole that opens up underneath and the whole surface just falls in. The house is partially in and one house is completely in and a car has fallen, right? Imagine that is what's happening on this cell. So when the ACE2 and the spike protein are being internalized, the nearby proteins can get pulled in as well. And guess which proteins get pulled in more drastically with ACE2 by the spike protein? These are the cell adhesion proteins or junctional proteins. These proteins, their job is to keep endothelial cells tightly sealed and attached to each other. Imagine these are tiny welding spots between the cells that have kept them together and that makes a barrier. These proteins, this is the latest study I read, these proteins become phagocytosed as well. Junctional proteins, for example, 
we see cadherin pcam1 jam1 connexin 43 when these are internalized then the cell to cell adhesion for barrier functions integrity that adhesion is destroyed and the cells become separated from each other which would then allow the substances to move out of the blood vessel and into the blood vessel this would be permeability problem this permeability problem in the barrier areas where we don't want any such thing we have put special barriers there that this does not happen in barrier areas this becomes even bad so barrier function is impacted then as we saw anti-spike 2 antibodies they have a problem molecular mimicry causes a problem anti-idiotypical antibodies they cause a problem as well in one other talk in the past and you can find that on the FLCCC educational material as well the mitochondrial dysfunction was discussed in detail so when the mitochondrial dysfunction occurs because of the spike protein on the endothelium or other cells then ROS production reactive oxygen species production increases that cell is in trouble plus local inflammation is going to occur plus the cell when the mitochondria is under stress the cell would start producing inflammatory mediators very important there is the IL-6 but IL-1b, IL-A, tumor necrosis factor alpha these are produced then as I said before nuclear factor kappa B signaling problem occurs and that problem check this out if it is endothelium this is also a new piece of information these are new gems today I think you would like them one is that as I discussed before leukocyte adhesion molecules will become expressed right so when there is unchecked function by nuclear factor kappa B enzyme system it's a system it's not one enzyme then the gene expression for cell adhesion molecules open up and the cells on the surface they start extruding and expressing cell adhesion molecule and they'll capture leukocyte or the white blood cells and the local inflammation would occur this is like although white blood cells are protective for us but unnecessary white blood cells are our enemies so this is like trapping an enemy an enemy is just going on its own way in the blood and you catch them and say stand here and that enemy just starts inflammation there so that is one the second thing this is also important and this is the first time I'm discussing here that is the coagulation factors from endothelium start becoming manufactured and released more when nuclear factor kappa B is activated more and who activates them more spike protein attached to ACE2 causes ENOS activity to reduce which liberates or disinhibits NFK kappa B which in turn causes the tissue factors and the factor 8 coagulation factor to be created in the endothelium and released which will also cause thrombosis so you see so many factors that would lead to thrombosis vasoconstriction sluggish blood flow platelet activation by the antiplatelet factor 4 antibodies platelet activation and aggregation because of less nitric oxide local inflammation in the endothelium because of the cell adhesion molecule expression and the white blood cells working there glycocalyx disruption the nuclear factor k beta expression increased which further causes cell adhesions plus that causes the coagulation factors to be formed any one of them can cause lots of thrombosis imagine how many mechanisms at one time are active imagine what would be going on now to balance it out please realize it doesn't happen to everyone it happens in some but in where it is happening these are some of the mechanisms that are working behind it and this can happen because of the vaccine this can happen because of the infection as well it's really the spike protein that we're talking about infection actually it is interesting the latest studies are showing that even the nuclear protein nucleocapsid protein of the virus can also cause endothelial dysregulation so here are some studies that I've already discussed one more quick piece of information the difference between ENOS and INOS we have become quite involved in this lecture so I'm just going to try to wrap up the INOS are inducible nitric oxide so imagine this is a cell in the respiratory system and this is a cell in the blood vessel in the blood vessel the cells have ENOS endothelial nitric oxide and in the normal cells the cells have INOS or inducible nitric oxide inducible nitric oxide when that enzyme works and makes nitric oxide 
then the nitric oxide that is produced, it works with reactive oxygen species and it makes proxy nitrate, which in turn causes carb damage, lipid damage, and then the nuclear damage. Why? Because in a regular cell, when nitric oxide production is increased, it is increased as a result of viral infections or other infections. So this all is actually a combative behavior of the cell to start destroying things around, thinking there is a virus in there. On the other hand, in the case of endothelial enos, when enos becomes activated, it produces the nitric oxide, but that nitric oxide does not work with reactive oxygen species the same way like here. It is vasoprotective, it is vasodilatory, it is bronchodilatory, it is antithrombotic, it is anti-cell adhesion molecule, it is anti-smooth muscle vasoconstriction and smooth muscle growth. Now, two more things that are first time discussion here. Number one, when the nitric oxide is produced, it causes the blood vessel wall and the smooth muscle in that wall to be less in growth. What does that mean? Normally, inflammatory states cause the blood vessel walls to grow in thickness. And that is done by increasing the number of smooth muscle cells. Now, we do not want our blood vessels to continue to become thick because they will become less able to contract or do vasoactivity because they have a strong cuff of smooth muscles. And secondly, the smooth muscles would need more oxygenation. And the thirdly, the lumen would become compressed or smaller and the vasoconstriction, kind of permanent vasoconstriction would occur. So we don't want the smooth muscles to grow unless there is a damage to the blood vessel. In normal physiological states, nitric oxide prevents the growth of smooth muscles. And imagine if you disrupt that nitric oxide with spike protein or some other protein or some other mechanism, then the smooth muscle growth would start occurring. That can cause damage to blood vessels permanently by increasing their thickness. Then the apoptosis of the endothelial cells. Nitric oxide on one end prevents the apoptosis of the endothelial cell. On the other end, it causes apoptosis of free stem endothelial cells circulating in the blood vessels. What does that mean? This is also the first time discussion here. So what happens is that our bone marrow continues to make endothelial stem cells or cells that can give rise to endothelium, that can make endothelium, that can convert into endothelium. Why? Because our endothelium barrier continues to become recycled as well. The cells die and we need to make new cells over there or we may need to make a new blood vessel somewhere and geogenesis is needed. So bone marrow continues to provide an army, parent cells, which if needed can be stopped at an area of injury or inflammation and converted into endothelium. Normally, we do not want these cells to start just becoming converted to endothelium. We just want these cells to check around if there is nothing needed, die away. Nitric oxide helps the apoptosis of such cells, which is a good thing. Because if these cells would start landing, they would start causing angiogenesis. They'll start making new blood vessels where we do not want a blood vessel. Remember, making new blood vessels in the tissues is not always the best thing. Yes, a tissue, for example, cardiac tissue where coronary arteries are not helpful because they're getting blocked. Making new blood vessels is useful. But if you make new blood vessels where there is not a need of them, then that tissue would become congested and the functional tissue might become even replaced by the new blood vessels. And if it is a cancerous tissue, then that cancer would make new blood vessels and just have fun with lots of nutrition coming its way. Nitric oxide puts a check on angiogenesis and VEGF. If spike protein is present, enos is reduced, nitric oxide is reduced, angiogenesis starts because the cells become active and there is no one to stop them. And then we talked about levoarginine last time. And then this is the nitric oxide and citrulline. And finally, we are back to the diagram. So I have tried that in this discussion, we have collected as much of pathogenic mechanisms as possible. I'm sure that there are so many that are still left out, but this is a good start. I would see you next time with the second part of this conference's presentation, and that will be the mechanisms to manage. And for that, we'll talk about intermittent fasting and then resveratrol and spermidine. Thank you very much, and I would see you next time. Bye.